So welcome everybody to Ask the Sexpert. I'm Dr. Ava Cadell, your host. And today my guest is Gregor Retti. He is the author of Sex, Ego, and Love. Now, he is an author and a global speaker with an explosive life, as you will hear in this interview, because at the age of only 13, he actually died. He met God and he lost all death related fears. Gregor describes it as a starting point that allowed him to explore life to the fullest, leading him to meet his soulmate and experience creative sexuality, and also meet a personalized form of the universe. And I'm sure he's going to elaborate on that. So uh, <laughs> welcome, Gregor. How are you today? I'm wonderful. I'm so Good. delighted to be with you. I have great Thank respect you. for you and for, with all the work you're doing and, uh, you know, making this world a better place. Because, ah, well, we have that in common. I think we're both healers and authors, and we love to help people to improve the quality of their lives. So that's exactly. why I want to interview you and find out first and foremost, what it is that inspired you to write this book. And when did you write it exactly? Oh, it's a good question, because a lot of time has passed since my... Um, pivotal moment uh, um, when I was 13 years old. I, you can read it or I can, uh, you can send forward the, the, the complete description of what happened to me and how I died. But in a very brief nutshell um, version, it was that I uh, did drugs. I was sniffing glue when I was 13 years old. I know you should not do that. Don't do that, kids. But it happened, and um, the the plastic bag got stuck on my head, and I got paralyzed. And um, it was really a, a complete panic moment because I couldn't move my body, but I, I felt I I just kind of left my body. I got detached from my body, and then I traveled with um, what I'm convinced about, but of course, scientifically, it's not provable, uh, with lightning speed. And it was since it was very dark, I, I felt like I was flying through the universe, and because there were like bangs and bright explosions and everything. So I traveled for about twenty-five minutes until I arrived at a place where there was an authority asking me to calm down because I have to make an important decision. And that decision was if I want to go back into my thirteen-year-old body or if I want to stay there. And I have to say, it's extremely inviting, extremely beautiful extremely accepting everything your heart longs to uh, is there so I was of course I had a very abused childhood so I, f I wanted to stay there I wanted really to stay there but my logic told me it's a 13 year old body you just don't dump it like you know it's almost like buying a car and after three months you bring it to the wrecking yard so I, I, I decided to go back and then he double confirmed with me. It was a voice, but not a voice like a language. It was a voice like knowing. It was an all kind of an all kind of knowing. But I felt as a personality completely intact. So it was still I was thinking and feeling, but without a body. So you had an and, out of body uh, experience. No, because out of body experiences, I, I read a lot about that. There are yeah. books uh, I urge everybody to read because this. Uh, inexplainable phenomena and uh, uh, the one is uh, the out of body is you kind of hover like a drone over your body you don't go too far away from your body you can be two meters half a meter 10 meters you can but this one I was definitely light years or, or whatever thousands of miles away from my body totally left it behind and I was in this wonderful wonderful place which I'm not supposed to be in but I was asked, and it's really interesting because you have the free will to choose. So that really showed me also the Buddhistic ways and, uh, the, the, you know, all the spiritual um, teachings we have. It's like, it's really up to us. It's up to our consciousness and our awareness. And my awareness at that point was fortunately that much together of thinking, you know what, I'm going to be back there eventually. Anyhow, I will, I will die like everybody does. With the big difference that I'm really looking forward for that moment. I'm going to be one of the people you're going to find with a smile on his face when they find my body. But um, 
So it's nothing bad. And this is really what I want to urge. And that's also one of the reasons why I wrote this book is like urge people to 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 face their fears. You know, you really this is one of the prime fears is the death. Um, also in the ancient myths, uh, in, in anthropology, is like it's always the fear of death is everywhere there. So it's an old thing. It's hundreds thousands of years old um, to get, conquer that. And the same thing with this. And now I'm, I'm segueing over into the sexuality is that we well, have a lot down, of fear. Slow down. Let me ask you. Okay. So, I, so yeah. you basically um, talk about this experience that came from adversity, obviously, sniffing glue. Why did you sniff glue, by the way? Is there, <laughs> were you, <laughs> what were you trying to accomplish? Were you trying to get high at 30? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, I'm 13 it. years old <laughs> and there is an all excessive drug and um, others do, I mean, it was not like I read about it and I tried it. It was like other people talked me into it. Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm, so, I'm a teenager. so I can ask you about what life lessons you are sharing with your audiences all over the world, um, mm -hmm. which obviously includes sexuality. But uh, what other life lessons are you sharing that can improve the quality of people's lives all over the world? And And is there anything different from one culture to another? Do you have to censor yourself? you know, your lectures, if you're talking in Europe versus in America. So I'd really be interested to find out what it is that you are giving us as a gift mm -hmm. during your mm -hmm. lectures. Yeah, the very important lesson is pretty much uh, peer pressure. And that's really culturally different. I mean, I've been also to Asia. I feel like there's a, the peer pressure is higher there. There are uh, countries where individuality is much more accepted. Uh, let's say like in the Netherlands, in Holland. Okay. Um, then there is countries like the United States, which is kind of, I would say, all over the map because it depends <laughs> what, <laughs> in the sense of like, depends if you're born, there's like little Bangladesh and little Pakistan in Los Angeles. And I know accidentally people there, they still live in a very tight, very, not even peer pressure, but like a cultural, um, very tight community. Not as tight, but like if they would be back in their homeland, much freer here, but still much more restricted than the average person would be if there's such a thing. So, what, kind of, what yeah. kind of peer pressure are you talking about? Can you give us an example? I mean, peer pressure can be, in, I mean, in my case, it was because of the drugs, not peer pressure. Nobody said, if you don't try it out, you're not cool. This is what teenagers usually the case. You want to be cool. That's why I start smoking cigarettes and what have you. But um, the uh, peer pressure can be also applied in, in a relationship. I mean, peer, it's not a, okay, maybe not the right word, but it's like the partner pressure. It's like when they try to, he, she or he um, tries to uh, get you into something sexual, to do which you absolutely do not want to or don't even you know i believe that everybody should try out as much as possible in sex life is too short uh, and like me i discovered great pleasures in things which i ruled out in my head before i said no i would never do that never ever would do that and somehow since my 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 basic uh uh, under, uh, belief system is that I need to try out everything before I say no. So, and then I discovered uh, really amazing stuff in sex. And sex was also something that helped me a lot in life to cope with the, with the outside pressure and with the abuse I went through as a child and everything and the traumas. I have a lot of traumas. I went through a lot of therapy. So also the it's all like kind of like built itself together as a, as a picture and that's what I am now. So in other words, sometimes a really bad luck or a really bad past or really bad trauma from your childhood or from your youth or even in a, in a relationship can later turn around and, and free you, you a lot as long you with attitude and open heart and open mind, you go at it. So. In other words, I could not sit here today and be completely happy, which I claim to be, 
I mean, I really have nothing what I can complain about or miss. Um, I couldn't be here if all these bad things would not have happened. And the same exactly. thing happened also. Yeah you're, yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, I think we learn more lessons, you know, from adversity than we do from successes. And, mm -hmm. you know, I like yourself, I've lectured all over the world, and there's no doubt that there is peer pressure for arranged marriages. For example, you know, in India, there is peer pressure in some of the Muslim countries for female circumcision, for example, which I think is absolutely horrendous. But horrendous. it's been around for centuries and there's mm -hmm. uh, in America sometimes there are some states where you have to be much more conservative because mm -hmm. of their programming religious mm -hmm. programming especially but I'm interested to hear what you said about when you have trauma and so many people watching this interview will relate to that they've had trauma in their lives abuse um, all kinds of trauma from addictions to toxic relationships to violence um you know domestic violence but i was very interested when you said it affects your sexuality which it does um so what advice do you have for somebody watching this who's been through some traumatic experiences like yourself what what sexual advice do you have for them to explore you know loving themselves and loving others and just expanding their sexual horizons? Mm -hmm. I mean, the first advice, it may sound a little bit uh, on the surface, but it, it, it has a deep impact, is never, ever give up. Never, ever give up searching for yourself. Believe in the good, believe in the happiness, believe in the horniness, believe in the great orgasm, even if you possibly did not have it as of yet. But it's all around the corner. It's And this is why we are on this planet Earth. We are getting incarnated and then we leave our body behind like what I did. And accidentally I had the chance of coming back, but I could have also, if I would have stayed there, I would have come back in another body. So the, really re the real reason I see why we are on this planet Earth is to master, master this fate, master this, this deck of cards we got dealt. So, in other words, it's it's wonderful. It's wonderful. I know it sounds harsh, but it's wonderful. Whatever bad happened to you, it's wonderful. As Buddha says, is only through sufferings are you able to to learn to become happy. So it's a, the greatest teacher of all. I mean, how many times I, I lived in Monaco for the last four or five years, and I was I was completely surprised. These were the richest of the richest people in the world who flee there not to pay income taxes. Pretty much, I would say 80% of them taking psychotropic medications and going to um, therapy. And uh, two of the people uh, committed suicide who were billionaires. So if you, that's not the way. You all think in this modern society doesn't matter if it's China or, or, or Germany or, or the US that money is to God and money is to happiness. Money is the greatest orgasm of all. No, it's not. It's really, it's us who are the greatest because we take powers in our hands like many people do. I would say in my, my experience, most of the people, 60, 70% of people turn the suffering around and, and become much more fulfilled much more wholesome and then they go around and help others like we do like you and me we, this is our mission yeah you suffer so let, too. i i agree with you so redirecting your suffering your anger your self-pity into something more creative is something that every human being can do we are able to reprogram our minds it's not easy obviously and uh you've done it very well and i know in your book you talked about experiencing a uh, creative sexuality. Can you expand upon what that looks like? Yes, thank you for bringing this up because it fits perfectly in here. The, the idea is basically that sexuality is a greatest gift from God or the universe or from nature, whatever. And it's wonderful to have that. 
but it is like a, a, a flower, like a plant. You have to attend to it. You cannot just stand it in the corner, never water it, don't give it sunlight, and expect it to, to, to blossom. So sex is exactly the same. Because, of course, every sex at the beginning is, is awesome because we don't know each other. There's the, 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 the factor of the unknowing, the, the lack of knowing. And the, the ego didn't take over with the securing or, or possessing the other one. So that's why sex is really good at the beginning. And then people ask me, oh, you know, we are married now for, doesn't matter if it's two or 20 years, when sex became so boring. And then I, I ask you, what did you do about it? What, how much do you know about your partner's uh, likes and dislikes and, and uh, their sexual fantasy? It's unbelievable how many people do not know about, I mean, couples do not know about each other's sexual fantasy. And in my workshops, I'm asking, uh, you know, everybody raised at the beginning, everybody raised their hands. Um, who knows this, uh, the, the sexual fantasy of uh, their partners? And there's barely, barely anybody. And then after, during going through the workshop and everything, when we discuss, there's like five, four or five main fantasies for, for men and four or five main fantasies for women. What and, are they? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's it's you know it's don't take my word but i can recommend wholeheartedly everybody pornhub is the biggest porn um uh, web uh, what you call platform in the world for all the world and they have a very interesting uh, uh place called pornhub forward slash statistics every year they compile the statistics and it's amazing eye opener and you can see exactly what men and women are about and how much it contradicts the myth. There's so much myth about sex because we never speak about it. Media never speaks about it. Church doesn't speak about it. Spiritual gatherings don't speak about it. And it's wrong. It's wrong because it's God's gift and somehow, and that's why I appreciate you so greatly. You're really one of my, the biggest star in, in this, on this earth, you and <laughs> Esther Perel. No, really, I really have deep respect because you, you. you're on a mission of, of getting out of this, this trap of getting stuck. You know, people are stuck somehow. And in this forward slash statistics, you can see, for example, uh, one of the myth, myth buster here I am, <laughs> um, that men are into young women and men because they, you see and read that rich men leave their, their older wives and they get into younger women. But at porn, it's not true at all. The, the biggest search and common across cultures, doesn't matter if it's uh, Asia or, or Europe or US or South America, is MILF. Mothers, I like to fuck. And very clearly, if it's a mother, it's not a teenager. So, and that's <laughs> so, that, one... so that's the number one fantasy for men? Yes. Yes. Wow, yes. Interesting. yes. Okay, and what it's... about for women? What's the number yeah, one? Yeah, I, I, will tell, I will tell you in a second, but... Uh, <laughs> It's just uh, very exciting to me how society has it all wrong, you know, and why does a man want that? And that, that, and I believe that is the truth, uh, that this, this myth number one, because it's number by number, by machines, by computers, by the computer identity, it's proven who's looking for it. Uh, it's because they like the experience. They don't like, you know, the, the, what they say, the, the, the big, macho teaching kind of role they don't even like sometimes they even like to subordinate themselves uh, a lot of uh, i think number three is um, being dominated by a woman a lot a lot of men like that in their fantasy they would never admit it they would be so ashamed to admit it to their wives because it's not that they, they, they societal role or, or a cultural mm -hmm. role a man needs to be the man like you know it's, it's bullshit it's really it is so i encourage you to to snoop around on those statistics and you will be the other thing the men uh, are crazy about lesbian uh, porn and whatever 268 percent more women watch lesbian porn than men wow oh my god it's like whoa so this is by the way one of the uh, I think it's the second most uh, liked uh, subject by women to look uh, when they're porn. By the way, uh, 
women's uh, statistics of watching porn is really going up in the last eight years. It, it's, mm. it's more than doubled, and, and which is a good sign. Interestingly enough, uh, India is the, the country where the most women by percentage compared to men uh, watch porn. So it's for them, it's, 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 it's good because it shows me some kind of liberation, some kind of getting away from the religious oppression or, or convention or whatever you want to call it. So it's well, a very porn, healthy. Porn is illegal in a lot of countries. And, you know, it's obviously taboo. And I know that when something is taboo, it makes it even more exciting for people. Um, so they do want to explore it. And yes, Pornhub is definitely a multi-million dollar business because people want to see it. Even um, in hotels all over the world, they say that adult content is actually more than sports. It's more popular than people watching sports. And yes. understandably, I mean, sex is our second basic instinct after survival. And it's, it is, I agree with you, it's a beautiful gift. It's the most precious gift that we can give somebody who is worthy of it. And so we should also give it to ourselves because self-love is of paramount importance um, in this lifetime. I think that that is one of the life lessons is learning how to love yourself. Do you... What do you do? What do you say? What do you advise for people, again, who've had trauma so they don't love themselves because they think that for some reason um, they are responsible for being raped, for being abused, you know, for all of the bad things that happen to them. A lot of people think they deserved it. So how can you mm -hmm. help those people to start loving themselves and stop punishing themselves mm -hmm. just getting back to the previous point of religion i just wanted to add that in because it's also in porn up statistics that in the united states where the religious power is the strongest which is in utah with the mormons and uh, mm -hmm. in the uh, southern bible belt as they call it uh, mississippi and where the, the church is very very strong they have to highest uh, Pornhub uh, visitors and the longest lasting. So there's the most time mm. spent on porn is where the religion is the strongest, which clearly shows there's a direct correlation. The same with India, where religion is very strong. There's also, as I, as I said before. The um, second que uh, the, 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 the question, getting back to your question, is um, how do we get um, how do we conquer? I, I call it like the inner demon. And I, that's why I also call it in my book, Ego, you know, Sex, Ego, and Love. And uh, the book used to be called Sex and Ego Death, um, wow. which was, a, it, yeah, I had to rename it because so many people on also in the bookstore, they complained about it's too dramatic and it's too freaky because death is involved. Americans don't like the subject of death. I mean, as, as you know by now, I don't have any issues with death. But um, um, so getting back to the, the, the ego needs to be conquered. And the ego is something that develops very strongly during these traumas. And I had a lot of, uh, I, I, I have to speak about myself and, and I, I'm not shy anymore. I mean, I, I used to be a little bit ashamed because I'm transgender. Um, in, when did, in you, a, in when did you discover? When did you discover that you are transgender? And how uh, did you discover it? <laughs> That's a good question. It was before my puberty. And my parents were embarrassed because I, I, I said to people, I want to give birth to babies. And uh, when I saw babies, when we went to visit uh, from other people, whatever, saw babies, I wanted to uh, nurse them on my breast. and. I said, no, no, you are a boy. You cannot do that and everything. And so that was before my sexuality set in. And then when my sexuality set in around the, the age of 10, I realized quickly that I like to dress up as a woman. And that gave me great, uh, not only a sexual thrill in the puberty, but also big, big, and, and even today, it gives me great peace, peace to my soul. It's It's hard to explain. And I don't say it's, a nice thing to have, and I'm sorry if I offend any transgender person here, 
Um, but for me, it was a struggle. It was, uh, you know, it was against the society and its societal norms. And I was so scared to be considered as gay, as homosexual, which I'm not. And um, I had to force myself. I was actually so scared about uh, uh, gay sex that I, I, have a, I had a real fear inside of me. And as I said, I'm, I'm working all my life to eliminate all my fears. So it took me about two, three years to force myself to become bisexual. And with that, I mean, I started to integrate male body parts into my masturbations and everything up until the point that I was kind of ready of like, oh, maybe try it out. And uh, my back then girlfriend knew about what I'm going through. And she very cleverly, not informing me, arranged for my virginity to be taken by a man in her presence. I was wow. like, well, but it was very, very, yeah, it was an amazing experience. I never had, and there was, how old was I then? Around 19. And I did not really had, um, I was not penetrated since then by a man, even though it was a wonderful, uh, very uh, liberating experience because my fear went away. Every time the fear, you conquer fear, that's the greatest blessing you can do. Wow, well, you're um, so courageous to share that with us too, because a lot of people have shame and guilt from sexual experiences that they enjoy, but they're afraid of being judged, even ridiculed. So mm -hmm. thank you for sharing and being so vulnerable. It's a, it's a beautiful thing when somebody um, shares their experience and their wisdom you're giving so many people watching this permission to explore mm -hmm. their sexuality and to feel good about it. And I think that's very, very important. And your book does the same. So when you travel around the world, so for example, do you censor yourself like in India? Did you still talk about your preferences, your transgender, or did you have to censor that? Because we do know that in India, they do actually have a very large transgender population. And mm -hmm. um, so I was just wondering how you introduce that or do you um, sort of just ignore it completely? Side sweep it. <laughs> huh? Yes. Yeah, Side so sweeping. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just wanted to add something on uh, to the one thing you said before. It, I don't really um, just want to make people feel good about, you know, um, conquering their shame and guilt and what have you. I urge everybody to do it. I think it's a responsibility. You are in this life and in this body for a reason. And only for this, the only reason for this is that you supposed to conquer these things. And there is a, what I see in my experience, there is sometimes the issue of women who uh, got, um, uh, you know, sexually abused is uh, that uh, they, um, that they, uh, that in a way, some of them, this is like two ways. So you can be sexually abused and just be traumatized, but you can be sexually abused and enjoy it. You have an orgasm. And yeah. I think that is a big problem. And uh, I, I urge the women to understand it is your body. It's your bodily reaction. You are programmed like that. This is a completely natural thing. If somebody plays with your clitoris long enough, yes, you will have an orgasm. So there's no shame about you know who played with your orgasm? If it's uh, your uncle or your 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 your, your brother or whoever, uh, the grocery store man or who, whatever it was, or your teacher or your priest, even um, you 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 have to separate that. Just because you had an, a pleasure and an orgasm and somebody violating you, it's not your freaking fault. It is a natural thing, and don't hold it over your head for a life. Yes, but I enjoyed it. I, I am bad. I'm disgusting. I am, I'm shameful. I, it's my fault. I attracted it because I enjoyed the orgasm. No, 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 no. You can have the same 
orgasm, the same attraction, everything on your own will. And when you do that, you it's a wonderful thing. It's called a great sexual relationship. And if it happens to you, you have been violated even if you en enjoyed it and not enjoyed it, even if you had an orgasm, it's a big, right. Your you body, exactly. The body is completely separate from the mind and the imagination and the emotional um, hormones that are, re that are released, you know, when you are being violated, as you said, you know, it's quite normal to get lubricated or yes. to uh, have this this orgasm without wanting it. Your mm -hmm. body can actually, uh, you know, and there's some sex toys, for example. I know whenever I lecture around the world, I take sex toys with me. And what I do is I encourage people to be interactive. And I tell them that I'm going to gift them all these different sex toys if, uh, you know, they they have experiential um, seminar activities with me. And so everybody wants sex toys. It doesn't matter where I am in the world. But the reason I'm mentioning sex toys, is that there are some toys that you don't even have to be in the mood. But the minute you put them on one of your major erogenous zones, you feel eroticism. So just like porn. You know, porn mm -hmm. also is, I believe, therapeutic. It can be. I mm -hmm. believe it can also um, be highly erotic for couples to watch it together. Or, of course, it's fantastic for masturbation, both mm -hmm. for men and for women. But there are people who say that they hate porn. Mm -hmm. And they are um, insulted when their partner mm -hmm. watches it. And some people even think it's cheating. Mm -hmm. so I know you talk about cheating quite extensively. What is cheating in your mind's eye? Yeah, cheating is in, in the tightest sense of the word is a betrayal of trust. And you have, we have to like analyze it. What, why would I consider somebody watching porn as betraying my trust. Obviously, there's a misguiding ego behind the picture, which is my misguiding ego, set, telling me that, Gregor, you're not good enough. She has to go away and, and, and watch a porn to get it off. And that's bullshit. This is uh, like we have it uh, anthropologically proven. It has nothing to do with anything. It's just somebody has, uh, it, it's like on the menu, you know, you go to the restaurant, <laughs> you're not going to order always the same freaking food. So yes, you have great sex with your partner, but your, your partner wants great sex in your, his fantasy, her fantasy with somebody else. In my case, it's mainly women who enjoy masturbating with or without porn or, with, or without uh, toys. And I never, ever would take it on as, as me being not good enough me being minuscule, this is where the self-doubt, the ego, the evil kicks in, the jealousy, the, the mistrust, the not sharing, the greed. This is all the polarization inside of our head. This is all the negativity, the positivity. Is, so the negativity, uh, let me quickly just, this is one, one part of, uh, important part of my lectures is, there's a polar, polar, polarization going on in our head is the negative one, which I just mentioned, which is the, all falls under the umbrella of fear. Fear and fear is completely connected to the ego. And then there is the, 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 the positivity, which is love. And love falls under the soul. Everything under love is trusting, sharing, being creative, very important because you just spoke about sex. Creativity in sex is extremely uh, important and uh, it's a responsible thing to do and for being creative that includes watching porn that includes using toys that includes doing role plays that includes fantasies and what have you I mean how many times can we do the same licky licky sucky sucky fucky fucky in the same bed in the same position at the same time same day of the week Oh, holy camoly. I mean, you're not going to go to McDonald's and 
order every day the same burger with same <laughs> fries for 20 years, I mean, you would die. And that's exactly what happens to love and sex. First the sex, and then later it affects your love. So yes, it's each player, meaning in this way, men and women's responsibility to come up with ideas. Come up with ideas. If you don't want to watch porn, fine. Then then dress up as a stewardess and have him come in as a businessman and serve him. Or whatever. Be the cop and arrest the woman for, uh, you know, speeding. <laughs> Getting out of the speeding ticket, she can give you a blowjob. You know, just play it out. Just just right. be like like kids, like little, little uh, kittens, you know, what you call it, little cats or little puppies, you know. This is extremely important. I understand, yes, there are many people with traumas, and it's totally, unfortunately, happens everywhere in the world. But um, these traumas you can overcome. If you have bad connection with sex, you have bad connection with with your body, you, you you feel you're overweight or you have wrinkles or you have burn marks or whatever on your body and you, you, you think this is really the, the root of all evil, uh, do a little bit of masturbation exercise, which is uh, I mentioned in my book. And that is, um, and this is more therapy than sex. It's not, it's difficult, I, I, I tell you right away. Um, you go and get yourself in a good mood, be alone, maybe be in a, in, a, in, a, in a hotel room somewhere, lock the door, don't let anybody in, make yourself a nice ambiance with candlelight and, and uh, incense, you know, uh, come out of a bath, put perfume on yourself, and then find a nice big mirror and start masturbating into the mirror. Discover your body. Discover the love you have for that thing. It's the most precious instrument you can have for your soul. Our soul is endless. It's going to get reincarnated, reincarnated, reincarnated thousands of times. This body we have today is a, a segment. So enjoy that segment. Learn to treasure it and, and worship it. And again, it's not easy. I've done it. Um, usually, I try to do it twice a year. I'm sorry to say it like that precisely, but... It's not easy, again. It is more like for therapy. And then- and When you, you look in the mirror, a lot of people don't like what they see yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah. So it's That's... really hard to, um, excuse the pun, to, you know, to mm. masturbate when you're naked and you are uh, you don't like your body. You know, maybe it's too thin, it's too fat, it's too, you know, uh, damaged from something for scars. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you, get people to change that in their mm -hmm. mind from hating their body, loathing their body, mm -hmm. to loving their body and, and just desiring their own body. How do you do that? That's what I was, uh, that's what I'm, I was explaining that you, you, you know, need out, you, you drink, you, I like to drink a bottle, you know, half a bottle of wine or smoke a joint or whatever. So I like it. <laughs> so you it's, relax. It's, so the first step is you have to relax. Yeah, whether you have to relax. relax. Whether it's yeah. drinks, music, chocolate. So whatever makes you feel relaxed, right? Yeah, and, and also the ambiance. Step. Make it nice. Don't have to bright sunshine beating up on you, whatever. Close the curtains. So you feel very safe in a, in a really good environment. Get relaxed. Do whatever it takes to for your mind to be a little bit, you know, on a different level. And um, and that's what I'm trying to explain. The very first time you will encounter the situation that you don't like yourself, or it's my God, what I'm doing here? That's silly. No, it's not silly because what you do is you close your eyes every now and then. You imagine your most favorite fantasy, um, whatever it is, a threesome, and and you in the middle, whatever it is. And so you get aroused and you get like, wow, you feel the waves coming over your body. Then you open your eyes, you look at your body and in your mind, you silence the ego. Oh, what is this? This is this ugly body I know for so long. No, it's not. It's a gift from God. And you integrate that. And then if you lose, for a man, you lose your erection because it's so difficult uh, or for a woman the same, then you close your eyes again. Again, you go back in your favorite fantasy and then you continue. And it's the first time and it's natural will be the, the hardest 
I mean, I think I took, first time I did it was over half an hour. It took me, so it's, it's quite time consuming, but you wouldn't believe what you get out of it. And that is, when you are really high up, you, you, you edge yourself towards the orgasm. And when you're like uh, totally there, like you, you have it for sure, then you open your eyes and you do an eye lock in the mirror with your eyes, your own eyes. And you look and you start coming. This wave of orgasm is coming. Suddenly you connect to your own soul. You want to, I get goosebumps. I have goosebumps right now just thinking about it. <laughs> no, it's, it's amazing. I mean, okay. Yeah, it sounds, it's a fantastic technique. I love it. And I hope that people watching it will also try this technique of self-love, self, -love, self um, you know, pleasure, because it's so important. Yes. Nobody teaches us how to do that. Uh, and so I that... kiss my, I even kiss myself. Ah, in the I learned to do great. that. And like, like literally with tongue, not like, so like with tongue. I, I understand, but you have to put the ego with the rationality aside and just search for the soul connection. Absolutely. The soul and the, the true love with yourself, for yourself, be there. You know, it's, it's amazing. And I, I yeah. And I love that. I know when I teach meditation, you know, after the meditation, I always say, give yourself a big hug, you know, with your arms and say silently to yourself, I love you. And people have never really said that to themselves, many people. And they mm. enjoy that two second um, exercise because it, then they open their eyes and they feel the love, mm -hmm. and the energy, the vibration. So how should we handle the fear of rejection when mm. we propose new sexual ideas to our partners? Mm. Very good. And possibly the strongest question in sexuality, I would say, in my experience, this is the most powerful um, force is the fear of rejection. And I really, honestly, everybody has it. I totally have it. And uh, everybody I met so far has it. So I don't know who does not have any fear of rejection. It would be very unnatural. So first of all, you have to make yourself understand that everybody has that fear. Yet, 99% or even more denies having it. Isn't that funny? I mean, not funny. It's, isn't it sad in a way? It's like, it's crazy. So accept yourself and accept your fear of rejection and become creative. This is really creativity. Remember, it belongs to the good polarization, to the soul, to the love. So creativity is extremely uh, important. And what I tell people, and you mentioned it before, watch porn together. They have statistics that Generation Z, the youngest generation, um, has the longest lasting relationship, even though they're very young, but they have really long lasting relationships. And I combine that also with the fact that where open, not open sex, but where sexual tolerance is the highest, which is in Netherlands, they have the highest uh, percentage of uh, couples married or not married, young or old, who participate in, in orgies or threesomes or swingers clubs and everything. And the contrary to the belief or the fear, I should call it, the ego, remember, that's the other polarity, um, where you think you're going to lose your partner to somebody else, it's just the opposite. It's statistically proven they have the longest lasting marriages, people who do things like that. So you secure your partner. Because well, sex but a lot of yeah. people are jealous. They feel jealous yes. when they see yeah, their partner the with somebody younger, more attractive, um, somebody that will do sexual creative techniques that you don't want to do. So how do you deal with that insecurity and that jealousy when you love somebody? Mm -hmm. That's exactly the point. The jealousy inside of me feeds itself by me being very narrow-minded and not allowing things to be become creative. The moment I start to become creative, the moment we, we start watching porn together, one week I pick a porn, let's say every Wednesday at 8 p.m. I pick a porn, next week you pick a porn. The week after I pick a porn, the week after you pick a porn. 
and with that, I don't even have to fear the rejection, the possible rejection. Because well, I'm just. I, I agree with that because porn, you know, you're watching it and the person isn't there. But when you have a threesome, for example, and you, let's say it's two women and one man, you know, the woman in the primary relationship with the man um, may get aroused by making his fantasy come true of a threesome. But then when she sees that her lover has such great chemistry, with her friend, it can result in the woman being extremely insecure and afraid that she's going to lose her man to another woman. So I, I, what advice do you have for this woman who's trying to make all her partner's fantasies come true, mm -hmm. but yet is really afraid that she's going to lose him? It's a very good question. And um, there is a development in everything. So you cannot jump, and I really, I even warn or urge my, my uh, participants not to do that, is go from zero to 100 in half a second. You cannot do that. It, you will crash. It's, or not, the relationship may crash. But the point is that you do it step by step by step by step. And with that, I mean, you apply creativity. Do some role plays, start playing roles, like what I said, the good cop and the, the, the speeding person or the, um, the, the teacher, the female teacher, the male student or the other way around, or the prison ward and the prisoner, whatever, whatever come you come up with. That's the, let's say it's a good start, I think. No, actually the first start would be using sex toys and, and masturbate in front of each other. That's very important. But before you do that, of course, you should be able to masturbate by yourself into a mirror. So it's kind of it's like it's a step by step by step by step. You you become creative and, and you come to the point that you start watching porns together. And I think um, that's an essential step that you know each other's fantasies and you feel comfortable. You don't even fear that that overlying insecurity and, and scaredness of how does the other one perceive you. Because yeah. after you after you overcome that, then you can start uh, playing around. And what I did in my relationship with my soulmate, and it was, and I have to say, it's soulmate. Then you get become like really uh, anxiety ridden. Maybe I don't know the right word right now, but scared that you may lose her. So, but I still we still went into it, and we had um, sex in in front of other people. And uh, people were, uh, there were, of course, sex clubs. It was not in, 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 not in the metro. <laughs> um, so uh, it was with like-minded people. But we were for three years or so. We had many, many times sex in front of other people, but nobody participated. We, we, we didn't want anybody there. We didn't want anybody to touch us. Fortunately, in this circle, they're very, very correct uh, people, very um, respectful people, I have to say, especially in Holland and, and, and Germany. Uh, where we did it mostly um, and it was it was wonderful and that brought us to the next step and the next step and then um, you know three sums we had two even though I personally believe that three sum is better with two men and one woman uh, if the man has some homophobic fears then please work on it overcome it I did it so you can do it <laughs> Everybody, but it's not it's does not end up that the two men make love with each other except if they really want to do it then fine but you don't have to worry oh he may put his penis into my mouth or my anus or whatever that's that's bs i i think it's barely ever can happen so anyway so be a little bit self-secure about that and then um, and with two men, it's much easier. I think it's by energy. Also, seeing my woman, sharing my woman, it turns me totally on. And the woman sees that I'm being turned on, and she's turned on, and and the guy. It, it's it's a wonderful dynamics in my experience. But maybe some other people have other experience. And then um, yeah, and then on the very end, we did after five six years, we we participated in orgies. But we right. were already in Germany. You said you 
in no, that was in Holland. And Holland. So would you say those are the the most sexy countries that you've been to? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yes. Germany yes. and Holland. And then what would you say is the least sexy culture? <laughs> <laughs> Um, the United States is still quite sexy, but by far not as much, but I would say the, the Eastern Europe or, or where the society is still kind of conservative and what have you, be, you can feel it. And I, we did, we went also to sex parties, but it was straight up boring, you know. Wait, which was, country was that? That was in Hungary. Oh, in Hungary, in, okay. But I heard also similar things about Romania. They, it, they just don't have the culture as of yet. It will be very different, in, maybe now already, because that was like 20 years ago or 15 years. So in the next 15 years, I'm pretty sure it's going to be an exciting day too. And Did you go, um, did you go to um, Thailand? Did you go to Bangkok to some of the clubs there? No, no. no? Um, I, I did. Play, and it, I, I found it quite interesting in Thailand, in Bangkok, I went to see a, a sex show, a live sex show, and there were ladies sitting in the front row with blue hair, older ladies just waiting to see something that they couldn't experience anywhere else. Um, but it was very mechanical. I, it wasn't mm -hmm. really erotic. The girls were using their pupococcygeus muscles, their mm. vaginal muscles to... Um, shoot darts <laughs> and pop mm -hmm. balloons and there mm -hmm. was one girl who had a pencil inside her vagina she was writing notes and um, it was really very entertaining but I can't mm -hmm. say that it turned me on so oh, there are you know every country has its own sexual I guess energy, you would call it. Yes, yes, yes. It's, we are culturally shaped. We I mean, are. I'm, I'm, I'm studying anthropology. As a matter of fact, today I have to uh, uh, write and turn in a 4,000 word essay about uh, anthropology and how it uh, influences us and how we are culturally shaped by it, including our sexuality. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big... Uh, uh, fan of studying these kind of things because it makes us understand and this way I can relate to the to the viewers or, or people who have self-doubts that no sweetheart it has nothing to do with you you are programmed like that our brains are programmed like that you're socially conditioned like that so don't take it onto yourself and criticize yourself you can feel free really free and and and, and happy about yourself and concentrate on the good things the good sides and not believing the, the bad devil, the, the ego, which will always misguide you. We'll always tell you bad things. We'll always tell you if you're single, oh, don't speak to that guy <clears throat> or don't speak to that girl. You will get rejected or whatever. And then you stay by yourself for years to come. No, open your mouth. And every, every time I'm going to Starbucks, I, I make a, a <laughs> I make always, I speak to somebody in line or a Trader Joe's at the grocery store. I always make it a habit to speak to people. And and you will be surprised how, how therapeutic that is too. It's like I agree with you. And I, and I think focusing on speaking to people from different cultures, from different age groups, it's so good for you, so good for the soul to connect with another soul. And mm -hmm. um, you know, even just a smile, it's it's a door of approval. And if you can give somebody a compliment then you'll make somebody's day and you'll also improve your own communication skills. And um, I love what you're doing around the world. And we do have a course on cultural influences on love and sex. And so I think that that's the audience that will be most interested in you, your workshops, in your book. And so mm -hmm. I wanna thank you for sharing you know, your experience, uh, your wisdom, your knowledge, mm -hmm. it's, it's empowering. As the Dalai Lama said, if you want immortality, then teach. When you teach <laughs> people, you will be immortal 
forever. Not that we necessarily want immortality. No, I don't definitely, definitely. Since I had my death experience, I don't want to be immortal. I don't want to be a legend. <laughs> I don't want to be streets or squares in town be named after me. No, no, no. I'm, I'm extremely happy. I mean, I let it go. I mean, it's a kind of a Buddhistic idea. It's like let go of your desires. And the same in sex. I mean, oh, it's very important. No, if I can still add that into there, is very, very important. And it's more towards men, but I would say 60%, not, not too much towards men, but uh, for men and women is try to serve the other. Don't chase your own orgasm. Try to imagine and feel yourself into what a pleasure it is to please somebody, especially if it's mutual. I mean, you can take turns there too if, if both somebody has an issue with that. Just learn. I mean, I had so many times sex, I didn't have orgasm. But I mean, my, my lady come, you know, two, three times, whatever. And it's, it's, it's just feels so amazingly good of having been there for somebody, opened up somebody. And, and it's, it's just wonderful. And maybe something else I want to add here is like, we need you and me and, and, and a lot of good souls, we need support. We need support by people who realize the, the, the message and the truth behind of what we are talking about and organize yourself. Make little meetup groups wherever you are in whatever country you are. And, and if you feel more comfortable, ladies amongst yourself, meet in, in China or in Russia and, and just dedicate this time for opening up and, and share your experiences. And it's, you wouldn't believe how much you help yourself, but how much you help society and your culture. And it feeds each, each other. And it's, it's so wonderful. So <clears throat> that's a beautiful way to end our interview and uh, empower those who are watching. So I want to thank you so much, Gregor. You are the author of a very unique book called Sex, Ego and Love. And where can people find out more about you, your work, your workshop? Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, I'm a little bit, um, I don't know what it is, but I don't have the right feel and vibe. I'm, I, I'm trying not to make money with this at all. So the, the thing is, it's, I have also no budget to support it. I may start charging something and then I can dedicate a person to take care of my social media but right now, I mean, you can find me. I'm very blessed with having a unique name, even though it's very short. It's Gregor, G-R-E-G-O-R, -E and the last name is Reti, R-E-T-I. And this is the handle pretty much anywhere because I'm the only one for uh, for my email, which is a Gmail. Uh, then I have a Facebook with that same name. Oh, good. So people can reach out on Facebook. Yes, anytime. Please invite me. I'm very happy as big of the audience. I do it to my... Sometimes I have audiences of six, seven hundred people at, at festivals and, and speaking about this exactly the same things. I know you and spoke at Burning Man, right? Burning Man, I did about eight different times. And did that's different. fantastic. And I well, have to say, there's a very good crowd. Yeah, 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 that's that's amazing. I want people to find you on Facebook and follow you and connect with you. And um, you let, know, let me just you're say making the world a sexier place. Ah, that's wonderful. I love it. But also I have the website Sex Eats. Okay. So the book is called Sex, Ego and Love. The website is called Sex and Love uh, Sex and Ego dot love. Because now you can have instead of calm, you can have love. So sex, sex and, and ego dot ego dot, sex okay. and ego dot love. Oh dot love. That's right. Yeah, dot, love. Dot, com, dot love. You can Fantastic. have dot love now. Okay, that's awesome. we're gonna put that on our interview Thank and then there's so also much. gregoretti.com so you can even oh, you find have that one too gregoretti.com <laughs> but i don't do anything with it because i don't have somehow the well you know what you can do with it you can put this interview on it i would love to let's please share it and i will you know let's promote each other and everybody in our circle absolutely our let's share in the knowledge share in the wealth share in the energy everything and that Thank falls under the soul so and the love. Yes. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much. And have a beautiful day. I wish you lots of luck and love and lust. <laughs>